Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, this might be a little loud here. One thing I've noticed when I've read Revelation, it talks about a lot about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I know there's going to be feasting and potlucks in heaven. It doesn't say anything about business meetings. So I, I don't know. Just I, We need business meetings, but I think I look forward to potlucks a little bit more sometimes. Hey, it has been a pleasure and an honor to be here with you this month. I continue to pray for the leadership of this church, for the congregation uh, that attends every week and ministers out of the community. You guys know who you are. You know what you do. You are a great church. Thank you for letting me be part of it for these past five weeks. Today's message is uh, called Love Defined. Love Defined. I've got some slides up on the screen, but I'm going to just go ahead and start here. Uh, about We're going to talk about God's love for his people. You are his people. Are you a people in here? Yep, so, some of us are weebles. We, we wobble, but we don't fall down, right? But most of the rest of us are people. Love Defined. You know, it really didn't take too long. Uh, the day after Christmas this year, we were out picking up some discounted items. I'm always looking for deals for my classroom. And I noticed that the employees in the store were divided into two groups, two different groups. One was handling returns and new purchases, right? But the other group, do you know what it was doing? It was switching out the stock of Christmas candy and seasonal items from, you know, your, your Rudolphs and, and your Santa-shaped chocolate bars to Valentine hearts and roses. Already on the day after Christmas, right? Love is in the air. I know uh, you're talking, hey, it's not even February yet, but it will be, and I can guarantee you all the, all the doors in my classrooms are starting to sprout hearts and red and pink themed paper. Love is in the air. What is love? Is it just another occasion to sell candy and cards? Love, 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 all we need is love. Does anybody remember the Beatles saying that a long time ago? How do we define love? Love is a buzzword in our culture, but how do we define it? How does God define it? How do we as Christians define love? If you or I take a, a quick glance through the plot lines of chick flicks or romance books or top 40 popular songs, this is what we find. Love is a feeling. It's sappy and gooey like a warm chocolate chip cookie. Love, yeah, that sounds good. Maybe there'll be some of those at the potluck, right? Love is all about your own wants and desires. Or this, love is fireworks. Thank you, Katy Perry. So as long as we're happy together, then it's all good. But when the sparks go out, it's time to move on. Or love is fleeting. Catch it when you can, where you can. Swipe right and see what happens. But is this really love? Is this how God defines love? Is this the way we want our Creator to treat us? Is this the way we want to be treated by our spouse, by our parents, by our kids, our friends, our congregation, our community? Is this how Jesus demonstrated his love for the people he encountered every day in his work and ministry? His banner over us is love. We sang that today. So what does God say about love? When we say, Jesus loves me, when we sing that old chorus, what does that mean? Will he dump me like yesterday's business for something better tomorrow? And I know a lot of people who feel that. They, they've been to the altar, they've been in church, but they feel like if they mess up, God's going to get rid of them forever. That's not what God does. Is God's love big enough to include me? What are the characteristics of God's love for his people. Fortunately, God reveals his feelings for us. He reveals them in the word of God. So let's go ahead, if you can rise with me today, as we read from the prophetic book of Hosea. Hosea is in the First Testament, towards the middle a little bit. Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading from the ESV today. Hosea chapter 11. Verses 1 through 9. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. 
the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and, and, and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I, Ephraim, who, yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know I'd healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. I bent down to them and fed them. Verse 5, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, He shall not raise them up at all. But how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hold you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebim? My heart recoils with me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Heavenly Father, I pray that you add your blessing to this word. Today as we dig in, God, may it transform our lives. May it change us in our, in our walks, in our talks, and in our, in, in our families, in our communities. May we love you evermore and praise your name. In your holy name, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. The book of Hosea that we just read from is, is, is called one of the 12 minor prophets. 12 minor prophets. There are more prophets than that, but these were the collection of the 12 little books of, of prophets. Uh, they're not arranged in chronological order, by the way, in your Bibles. If it were, Hosea would be the second out of the twelve, but it's not. And Hosea is writing, just to put you a little context in the history, he's writing from the northern kingdom of Israel. You might recall that after Solomon's sons, uh, the, they both sort of rebelled and they went their way and the kingdoms were split and they fought against each other and there's a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so Hosea is writing from the northern kingdom years later during the 8th century B.C. Uh, up, up to about 721 B.C. And that's when Samaria comes in and conquers the area. You see, Hosea is writing to a people in a time that they have been attacked, they've lost everything they've hold dear, it's a time of wrecked dreams, of vanquished hopes, and shattered relationships. Not a great time. Yet in this midst, we have chapter 11. And chapter 11 is all about love. Ho Hosea, the entire book, is a great little book about God's love. But chapter 11 really gets down to the core of it. In a moment, we'll, we'll explore several of the themes and the strands and the characteristics of God's love. But to understand this particular chapter and the depth of God's love, we must first grasp a hold of Hosea's story. Everyone has a story. You have a story, I have a story, we all have a story. The classic Hollywood romances of eras gone by end with the giant kiss as the credits begin to roll, but we know life doesn't work out like the movies. Whatever reasons we have, we're imperfect humans. We do mess up relationships. Dreams die. Family shatter, love breaks, but this is what I know God restores. And that's the story of Hosea. He writes from his pain. He writes from the innermost turmoil. He writes from the wounds that have happened to him deep within his own relationships. He's not unlike many of us. He's been hurt before. And as we catch a glimpse of, of the relationship dynamics in his family, it reads like a daytime reality TV episode. Is this my kid? Someone's in jail? Hosea was even called crazy by everybody around him. 
God picks interesting people, by the way, real people, authentic people, people like you and I, to share the stories and to reveal truths about God's immeasurable character. If you've been in, ever in a relationship that has not turned out the way that you thought it, you wanted it to turn out, you might recall that God was there with you during those times. God doesn't go around pointing fingers and assigning blame and condemning you. But what he does, he uses those experiences, comes alongside of you like a mentor, like a friend, to begin to heal you and to restore you and to let you love again. Some of you might be in the middle of a situation right now and, and you don't see God. So what I'm saying to you, give God a chance. Trust the writings of Hosea because God is there. For centuries, people have studied this passage, perplexed by the depths of God's love. On this next slide, I, I want to show you for all you art historians of you out there, this early image from 1372, it's, it's artwork, it's an illustrated Bible. Um, when we see Hosea embracing Gomer, despite what has gone on, if you don't know his story, listen. Hosea did not have the ideal marriage. At some point, though, he married his one true love, almost like a Disney movie, right? Her name is Gomer. Do you know any Disney princesses named Gomer? Scholars are mixed on whether he knew at the time of their uh, wedding that she had a character that was unfaithful. The Bible describes her as an adulterous woman. And we know what the law of Moses says, what the penalties are for a person caught in adultery. But Hosea, in this story, never utilized those options. He continued to embrace his wife. And his love affair, his love that he had for his wife, becomes an allegory for how God loves us. As time unfolded, Hosea learned the truth. His first son was named Jezreel. Jezreel means God will sow. You know, we reap the natural consequences of our actions. Last week as we were eating lunch after service, I, I grabbed the hot fajita pan, even though he just told me it was hot, right? That's a natural consequence I got burned. We reap the consequences of our actions, whether we intend for them to, uh, to be however they are to be, or what they hope for, we reap those. His second born, and kids be glad you aren't the second born, or at least you didn't get this name if you were the second born, was named Not Pitied. Because Hosea learned of the ongoing unfaithfulness of his wife. The emotions of love that he might once had felt that might once have been present are probably, I would think, would be leaving. And then the third child is born. And this name is cringeworthy. It means not my people. No DNA testing was available back in those days, but it was pretty obvious. You're not my kid. I don't even know who your father is. Those events would take a toll on any relationship. And they must have. Because when we turn several chapters later, we find out that Gomer has left Hosea, continues to make wrong choices, ends up as a slave. And perhaps what started as careless flings developed into a situation where she was now human trafficked. Where she might have had some control in the beginning, she has none now. She had to be rescued. Enter Hosea again. Because he still loved her. He purchased her out of jail. He took her out of slavery. For whatever reason, he still valued her. And it's this story that serves as the basis of the allegory of God's love for his people. Allegories give us grand sweeping themes with enduring truths, but they cannot be pressed in on every detail. 
do not try to use Hosea as a map for your own love life. There's too much heartache there. And while Hosea is written from a male perspective, let me make it clear to anyone listening today, broken relationships and wrong decisions can be caused by either gender, male or female. The allegory could just have been written easily the other way around. So this short background gives us a basis for what is being revealed by the time we get to our text from chapter 11. It's no longer an allegory. This is God unabashedly looking and longing for His people to be restored to Him. For His people to once again lift up their arms in praise. For His people once again to say, I love you, Lord. And while the original setting was God's love for His covenant people of Israel, these same traits are true of God's love for us today. And folks, when I say us, I just don't mean the people in this room. Because God happened to come for all of humanity. He came for the worst sinner. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote that I am the worst sinner. I'm the chief sinner of them all. He came for the most pagan. He came for the most broken. He came for the worst thing you can think of. If there's nothing else we can learn from Hosea, it's that God loves people at their worst before they are cleaned up. He sees the promise that they have deep inside. I know the church has these eyes. I know this church sees others as God would have us see them. Oh, this is not to excuse the injustices that occur. This is not to excuse the church too uh, issues. There's plenty of issues that we got to fix in our own house. There's plenty of times, even with the church, we don't elevate women to the status that God has called them. There's plenty of time we sweep things under the rug. God still is a God of justice, but He's also a God of love. This is no star-crossed lover who overlooks the faults. No, this person, this person is whose love has been strengthened by the trials of fire. Every fault has been cataloged, and yet love still flows. His banner over us, love. Love defined by God. Here are some of the characteristics of God's love for His people. The first point I have today is God's love is nurturing. God's love is nurturing. When Israel was a child, I loved them, verse 1. I bent down to them and fed them, verse 4. Part of the joys of being a parent is that you get to nurture your kids. Unfortunately, nurturing has often been sometimes in our culture seen as the role of only the mother, but I can guarantee you kids need the love from their dads. Let me say it again. Kids need love from their dads. They're starving for it. I see it every day when I walk into a classroom. They just want a hug. They just want an attaboy. They want someone to say, good job. They're starving for that love. They want to be held and comforted and protected. Someone, they want someone just to take a minute to listen to their life. And I guarantee you folks, there are lots of kids living in pain. Lots of broken homes that they're in. And all the time it seems like it falls upon those kids. They need a dad to listen. They need a mom to listen. They need a God to be involved. They need a church to reach out to the community with backpacks or programs or services or, or just love. 2 a.m. without fail. Thankfully for me, it's been about 20 years. But someone always wanted to be fed at 2 a.m. Every single night. It took me a while to train her to go to the cupboard and get out an easy mac and cheese and put water and put it in the microwave. But that, that, this is hard to do at 18 months, but I, I almost succeeded. But I, I will tell you, there's no greater feeling in a sleep-deprived way of holding on to a little baby, rocking them in a chair, giving them in a bottle, and then feeling that world-class belt splash across your face. Part of the joys of parenthood. I, of course, wasn't up as often at 2 a.m. as my wife, but those times they were special, and my wife made me get up with her anyway, so this is my baby. I got to feed her. God is saying in these verses, you're my baby. When you were little, I fed you. When you were little and you had those sleepless nights that you don't remember, I was there. 
because that's what our Heavenly Father does. God's love is nurturing. He desires us all to grow. All fathers as a dad, I, I want my kids to be better off than, than, than they are. I want them to be better off than I ever was. I want them to be successful. About seven years ago, I think, um, we, had, we got a new state commissioner of education here in Kansas, and I went on the listening tour in a couple of different places, and we divided up into gr groups, and, and, and you, you might remember this. The, the question was, was asked, uh, what do you see the measure of a successful 24-year-old Kansas student? And with laughter, most people said, someone who doesn't live in my basement anymore. Someone said, you know your kid has finally made it when the first time your kids pick up the check for dinner. But then we went on to more serious items. There is truth that we as parents desire the best for our kids and, and we nurture them along the way. The same is true for our Heavenly Father. He will be there in our darkest hour. He'll be there in the deadest night waiting to feed you and to nurse you back to life. The second characteristic that I see coming out of this chapter as Jose uh, looks at this uh, love story here is that God's love is inescapable. God's love is inescapable. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness with the bands of love, verses 3 and 4. You cannot escape God's love. Even when you think he's not there, he is. A kid, a kid once described it, God is like a ninja. We might not even recognize his presence, but he's everywhere. As a much younger kid, I, I love sneaking up behind my younger siblings. I was the oldest. I love making them jump and scream. Anybody ever do that to your siblings, maybe? confession time. What we need is some love ninjas. Can I put that out there? Some love ninjas. What we need is some sneak attacks when a person least expects it, demonstrating a tangible act of God's love. A simple card, a basket, a phone call, a hug, a meal, whatever it is, coming out of the surprise, not even being asked to do it, but just do it. You know how those things brighten your day. We know what it feels when God brightens our day, so let's do it for others too. In the stupor of our pain, we don't often realize who is tending our needs. If you've ever been rushed to the emergency room, the throbbing jolts of pain attacking your nervous system, there's a good chance you do not even remember who jabbed your arm with that life-saving needle. We are just trying to cope to get through the experience that we don't realize that our heavenly comforter is here with us the whole time. He's everywhere. And so this portion of the scripture uses two different analogies. The first one is that of a physician healing the patient. And the second is that of a cowboy, which I can appreciate out here. Lightening the load of an animal, removing the yoke. Come unto me, Jesus says, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Jesus continues to make that offer. No matter where we are in life, he is everywhere. He's not going away. He's inescapable. The third characteristic of God's love I see here is God's love is relentless. God's love is relentless. We sang a song last week that talked about that. Verse 7, my people are bent on turning away from me. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can you hand you over, O Israel? Verse 7 and 8. You can hear the anguish in God's voice. God is stubborn. For whatever reason, he is not easily jilted. Relentless. When you were in high school, did you ever pursue somebody? Maybe college? I won't say stalk because that's something else. But you weren't going to take no for an answer, like, please take me to the prom. They have all these prom proposals nowadays. Did you ever serenade someone outside the window before the angry dad came out? There are two ways to look at this. You're either relentless or you're desperate. It kind of depends upon the outcome, right? My wife was relentless. She wouldn't take no for an answer. I tried for about six months. When we first met, I had someone else in mind. She actually interrupted that date. 
she set about to change that. It got to the point where I finally told her flat out, no, I'm never going to fall in love with you. I'm never going to marry you. Who, who wants to know who was wrong? 29 and a half years later. I tell you, I, I found out what it's like to be a man at Lowe's when the new barbecue is 75% off and there's only two of them left, right? I discovered what it felt like to be the last cute pair of cute boots on Walmart on Black Friday right after Thanksgiving. I was hunted down. Now that's kind of a funny story, but it reveals something about the relentless passion that each of us have that can often drive us. It reveals uh, to us that a no-holds-barred, go to the ends of the earth, I've got to have a kind of attitude, I'm going to go get the one and leave the 99 to go save that one. That's the kind of attitude that God takes towards each of his people. Do not think you can get away from his love because he, God, will go to extreme measures to demonstrate his love for us to the point of even allowing his son, part of the triune God, to be crucified and resurrected, to break the chains of death and despair, to break the bondages of darkness that hold us in jail, paying the penalty just as Hosea did for his wife Gomer. Our God's love is relentless. This is love defined. The fourth thing I see is our God's love is merciful. Thank God for his mercy. Verse 8 says, my heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Under the terms of the covenant, the mutually agreed to by the people of Israel and by God through the actions of Abraham, Moses, and David, there are clear stipulations set forth what will happen if one side breaks it. The warranty is no longer valid. You can't get a refund. Like the sign of the store is you break it, you pay for it. Yet God in his mercy made sure that there was a way out because God co-signed the agreement. We see this in an elaborate ceremony played out in Genesis 12. If you ever want to take those passages and dig it deep, he agreed to pay the price that his people would owe. So as he gets ready to enforce the penalty, his mercy and his compassion well up within him and override him. He physically recoils. It's like a rattlesnake ready to strike, which suddenly drops its aggressive attitude and position and slithers away. And God halts his action because God, the God of compassion, steps in. This is mercy. This is love defined. It's mercy in the face of a certain death. It's a hug instead of harsh words. It's a pardon for unforgivable actions. And let me remind you, we still have justice. But there's mercy too. Many years ago, while flying back from some conference halfway across the country, I read this book called Redemptive Teaching. As a teacher, I was interested. As a Christian, I was interested. Redemptive teaching. Written for Christian school teachers and Christian administrators, it challenges us to demonstrate the redemptive love that we talk about in church all the time the next time someone sets foot in the principal's office. That can be hard to do. A few days later, I remember a seventh grader coming into my office. His backstory, raised by his grandparents, never had met his father. No mother in the picture. Life for him was not the full experience of love that we want for our kids to have. He was in trouble, again. And after the typical, typical discussion and a little bravado and then some sniffles and then the plan on how we move forward, we got to the time for what the consequences would be. So then I tried something I'd never done before. I paid them. He had stolen some stuff. I just didn't say they didn't exist. I took my time and my money and I paid the penalty. And I didn't call home this time. And I re-explained to him that this is what we call mercy. An undeserved favor. That episode left a lasting impression on my mind some 15 years ago. And usually you don't know how those conversations and actions ever have an impact. 
But about a year ago, he tracked me down on Facebook. This was back in California. A young married man now, working hard in his career with a newborn baby girl, thanking me for taking the time to be active in his life. See, words matter. Actions matter. Mercy matters. Redemption matters. Love matters. There are times we are so quick to judge and to be in a hurry and to be right. Let's learn how to recoil like a rattlesnake. Let's learn how to recoil like Christ does and get that christ left attitude and show some mercy. The fifth point I see coming from verse 9. Our God's love is powerful. Our God's love is powerful. How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebuim? I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. What takes more power? Unleashing fury or holding it in check? I have to clench my hand sometimes to hold it in check. There is no question God has power. In case you doubt it, <laughs> Hosea reminds us by mentioning a couple battles really briefly. Too simplistic to really call them simple battles. They were obliterations, annihilations. In case you don't remember the cities of Adma and Zeboim, does anybody remember those? I didn't think so. It's usually because they're the last two mentioned in a quartet. Sometimes all you have to do is say a couple cities' names to recognize the kind of destruction and pain and, and, and annihilation that occurred there. Gettysburg, Dresden, Hiroshima, the Twin Towers. Places that were filled with displays of horrific power and destruction. And in the biblical times, it was these four names that were always mentioned. Adma, Zeboim, Sodom, Gomorrah. We're often more familiar with those last two, Sodom and Gomorrah. And just by mentioning their names, a shudder would creep down the spine and float through the minds of those listening to Hosea's words. God's love is powerful enough for utter destruction but it is also powerful enough for stemming the tides of destruction. What is more powerful, the wind-whipped roaring waves of the Colorado River or the massive reinforced concrete barrier of the Hoover Dam holding them back? God's love is even more powerful when it is used to exalt His people. We show our power when we use God's power to use words that lift people up instead of tear them down. We show the power of love when we support someone during the horrific times of life, even if they deserve our scorn and abandonment. This is God's demonstration of power. God's love is powerful. Love defined. God's love is never ending. My sixth point today. God's love is never ending. From verse 9, For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. See, God's love never ends. He will not change His mind. He isn't like us. He's not ruled by the passions of the day. He's decided once and for all that He loves us. He's decided once and for all that He loves you. No matter what, no matter where, no matter why, He loves you. He chose to be in our midst. He chose to live with us. He chooses to be part of our lives. His presence is with us. He chooses us. His holiness is true, but it does not condemn us in our sinfulness. It, rather, it comes alongside us and offers an opportunity to see what truth is and to experience real love again. Some of you may need to experience real love again from God today. I want us to remember this as we close and as the worship team comes up. We'll be playing um, uh, this great God song we just sang a minute ago. I want us to remember this. The God of the universe, the God who created each one of us and nurtured us, will do whatever it takes to offer His love. 
the God of the universe, the one who created us and nurtured us, will do whatever it takes to offer his love. God's love is great. God's love is big enough for you. I've met too many people that have sit, sat in, in seats and they think they are not worthy of God's love. They come up and they pray at the altar and the next week they still feel they're not worthy of God's love. Let me tell you, that is a lie from the enemy. God loves you. His love is for you. And this message today is not just for those of us who need to embrace God's love for the first time or a second time or a third time. It's also a challenge to all of us who have been the recipients of God's love. Oh, I thank God that I've received His love. Because we are the ones who know what it means to feel nurtured and to be cared for and to be shown mercy and to be forgiven. So ask yourself this today, in this final slide, ask yourself this. Do you love Jesus as much as He loves you? Do you love Jesus as much as He loves you? And the follow-up question, do you love others as much as He loves them? Do you love others as much as Jesus loves them? What are you willing to do today to show God's love to your family, to your coworkers, your neighbors, your seatmates, your friends, your town? Jesus loved us so much, He gave it all. Shall we pray?